And of course, it's fun to meet a lot of new people too, which is great. Um, my name is Alexandra Snyder. I'm the CEO of the Life Legal Defense Foundation. As some of you may know, we are a pro-life nonprofit law firm. We handle a wide variety of cases implicating the protection of vulnerable life. So we handle cases um, involving pro-life counselors, um, pro-life advocates who sure, are outside because, abortion um, clinics and who are harassed sure, and, and um, threatened, arrested sometimes. I know Brian Gibson with Pro-Life Action Ministries is here. Here he is, knows a lot about that. <laughs> so um, we represent uh, pro-lifers in that context. We represent people who are um, either terminated from their jobs or threatened with termination because of their pro-life views. Um, we've handled a number of cases involving pharmacists, for example, who in some states don't just have to dispense um, abortifacient drugs, which is bad enough, but they also have to prescribe them. And so um, we've had a number of pharmacists who work for CVS and, and big chains like that that we um, have represented successfully and gotten them um, a, an accommodation so they no longer have to facilitate abortion. <coughs> we also um, represent a lot of pregnancy centers. That's a big issue right now in states like California. I live in Sacramento. Um, states like California, Illinois, New York, you. Um, you. states like that, and coming soon to Minnesota. Um, they are really going after pregnancy centers. Which I can't really figure out because it's like, these are organizations that for the most part don't take a penny of taxpayer dollars, do a phenomenal job on, sometimes on very little resources, save a lot of lives, give women actual options, um, women facing unplanned pregnancy, and yet the abortion industry hates them. I mean, it is, you can't even describe the vehemence with which um, these pro aborts are going after these centers. It makes absolutely no sense to me. But that is what is happening in a number of states. So in California, for example, the Attorney General just served nine, possibly ten now, it, every day the, the number racks up, um, pregnancy centers with these very complicated subpoenas because they want to know everything that they're doing, everything that, about what they're doing, and. Why are they doing it? When are they doing it? All of that. And, um, and these are centers, for the most part, who are licensed by the state. The state should know what they're doing because the state gave them a license to practice. Um, and yet, they're just, they just want to make their lives miserable. And they know that by filing these subpoenas, they're going to scare these centers. And that, that's their goal. So we have attorneys working on that. We've been able to tell the, the center directors, don't worry about this. Um, we have your back, we've got this covered, we have experience with this. Unfortunately, we have a lot of experience dealing with attorneys general, not just in California, but in a number of, of hostile states. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what we do. And then we've handled cases involving um, direct forced abortion, so girls who, um, were molested so and went to Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood said, didn't ask them no, any questions. Gone, you know, when a 12 year old walks into their office, they don't ask oh, questions about, about how room. did you get pregnant? Yeah. Who did this? What are Sorry, your circumstances at home? And so we were able to come back after the fact and, and sue um, Planned Parenthood in cases like that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we handle a lot of cases involving the denial of life sustaining care. And some of you may have heard this before, but um, I used to call these end of life cases until I realized this was not actually, would not actually be the normal end or the natural end of somebody's life if it were not for a hospital or in some cases a family member that was um, seeking to deprive a person of basic care. And we're ta I'm not talking about uh, you know, extraordinary care. I'm talking about food and water, nutrition and hydration, sometimes given through a feeding tube, very basic like things like that, and we get calls multiple calls a week regarding cases like that. And we have a wonderful group of attorneys here in this area who've handled um, cases like that for us and very successfully to where people who would have otherwise been dead through starvation and dehydration are now alive and, um, and still living their lives. 
Um, a big priority for us this year are, um, is the, uh, just the plethora of constitutional amendments that would guarantee a right to abortion through pregnancy. And I know in Minnesota, you've got an equal rights amendment. Um, I think the pro-life groups here are doing a phenomenal job keeping that at bay. But please pray that they continue to do so because that's really, really hard work. And the legislature here, as you I'm sure all know, is not particularly friendly, but you still have you still have some good ones here, and so you are able to stop those things. <coughs> but I, I do know in California, um, we already have last year, or I mean in 2022, I'm sorry, uh, they passed a, um, a statewide amendment that guarantees a constitutional right to pregnancy effectively through birth. And that's what would happen here with the Equal Rights Amendment. So please be praying about that. If, there, if you can call your representative, that would be really helpful and tell him or her, I don't approve of this. This is too, too far, too far. We have a website, we, don't, we're st we still have our Ohio information on it, but we're gearing up for these next battles. But we have a website called Abortion Too Far where we um, have information about what these constitutional amendments actually do because the, the language that is used to get these things passed is very, very deceptive. They will talk about individual freedom, a right of a person to make their own health care decisions, and a lot of people who are voting don't really know or understand what that means. And so if you have an opportunity to talk to your family, to talk to your neighbors about what this Equal Rights Amendment does, and I'll just give you a list of things, um, a short list, and then you can contact Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life, MCCL, there are representatives here tonight. You can contact them and get more information, but it would guarantee a right to abort a baby for any reason at any time up to birth. It would deny parents the right to know when their minor daughter undergoes an abortion. It would enable sex traffickers to hide from parents and law enforcement and subject their, subject their victims to forced abortion, and we know that happens. I used to work a long time ago with an organization that worked with domestic um, victims of sex trafficking, children between 12, the ages of 12 and 16, and this was very common. All of the children that we saw had had at least one abortion. And then it would make unlimited abortion the permanent law of the land in Minnesota because the thing with these amendments is that you can't just, they are very difficult to overturn. So it's not like a regular law as if that weren't bad enough and you've certainly had that experience here in Minnesota. Um, but this, this is worse. So please be praying and, um, and then again, if you can talk to people that you know who you think might be inclined to, uh, they won't be voting now, but might be inclined at some point to vote for something like this, let them know what this actually does. So, thank you. And now it is my honor to introduce your speaker for this evening, Michael Kenny. So Michael Kenny is a writer, producer, educator, and lawyer. So that is quite the resume. And he's advocated for preborn human beings and their families for more than 40 years. Michael currently serves as president of Pro-Life Partners Foundation, which was created to support the entire pro-life movement and create a society that, um, that will re reinstitute a culture of life. Michael practiced law for 13 years before holding various cabinet level roles in Catholic higher education for nearly 25 years. His film credit includes the film Unplanned, which many of you might be familiar with. It's Abby Johnson's story. And Pray, the story of Patrick Payton. Payton sorry. Um, he's published numerous articles and co-authored the book In God We Trust, Morally Responsible Investing, which is a great book. I highly recommend it. The story behind a pro-life mutual fund with more than 2.5 billion dollars under management. Michael holds undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Notre Dame and a Master's of Law from <coughs> the George Washington University Law School. He and his wife Mary Claire have been married for more than 35 years and they have seven children. 
So please join me in welcoming Michael Kenny. And I did just want to. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, this is our Life Legal is based in Napa, and so we have a um, very generous local vintner, pro life family, who um, produces a, a wine label for us. And so I'd like to you. give you. you that. And we have a little. That's um, beautiful. Thank you so much. A little bag that you can hopefully get that on the plane with. <laughs> wow, fantastic. Uh, thank you. I'll just <laughs> so, yeah, you can <laughs> lose it. That down. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. And it's, um, it's, it's just such an honor to be in a position to invite you to support Life Legal. It's, uh, it's well known throughout the country as uh, the gold standard of work in, in the life industry. So uh, I want to uh, express some um, particular gratitude to Russ Rooney, who invited me to come here a couple of years ago. And so I'm, I'm glad that uh, that worked out well enough to be able to come back. And, uh, uh, he's a, a terrific leader. Um, I wanted to thank Mary Riley as well, who has is, is, uh, become a very good friend in the sense that our, our trajectories are similar. We have seven children. We graduated the same year from college, and um, so it's been a lot of fun getting to know Mary. Um, I also want to recognize Al, our 103-year-old uh, teenager here. Uh, <laughs> And, and just what a, um, a privilege it is to have him in the audience and to have him say that beautiful prayer before dinner was uh, really inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> Al, we determined, Russ determined mathematically, would, be, uh, in, would have been in a position to have met someone that would have known Abraham Lincoln. At least <laughs> it's pretty, pretty marvelous to think about. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, Tonight's program, I'm um, mixing a number of, of stories and, and videos, and uh, I want to thank all those here at the venue who've been working to make this possible. Uh, it's a combination of a presentation, and then at, at a point, I'm going to invite you to uh, consider these, these little, um, little stories that are, that are part of the video. But I, I wanted to um, point out that the person you just heard from, Alexandra Snyder, is Life Legal's CEO and, and truly one of the nation's finest lawyers. Uh, the materials that are produced through uh, the Lifeline issues are just spot on perfect uh, from an attorney standpoint. So in the summer of 2022, uh, Alexandra published a, a beautiful article on the 14th Amendment, and you'll see that one of the life ads that we're presenting tonight is on that theme. She was um, right out of the gate after Dobbs um, produced just a terrific article. And then um, this past winter issue, the winter 2024 issue, she issued an article called Deceptive Child Killing Ballot Initiatives. And it's the finest summation of the other side's political strategy that I've read. So I, if you, the, hopefully there our copy is still back at that table. So thank you for supporting Life Legal. They are essential. They are a lifeline for our nation. They, they represent the people on the front lines and, and many others. And finally, I want to thank Rick Bush, who has enabled uh, this to be seen on the internet. We have lots of different wires running around and cameras, and hopefully it's all working. It seems to be. <laughs> and so uh, thank you for doing that, and a component of that is Alpha News, and so this is um, available on Alpha News, and, and perhaps there'll be a recording that you can also see later. Russ is saying that's true. So, so tonight, let's explore the American dream and the State of the Union with the help of Abraham Lincoln. And before we begin, let's acknowledge that so many have been impacted by abortion, and that our nation has been deceived, intentionally misled. Dr. Nathanson, the doctor most responsible for the legalization of abortion, recorded a brief message as he was dying. He said, teach the strategy of how I deceived America. 
Tell America that the co-founder of NARAL says, love one another. Abortion is not love. Stop the killing. The world needs more love. Dr. Nathanson dedicated the last three decades of his life to undoing what he had unleashed. In his 70th year, he became Catholic. His conversion points the way for our nation's conversion. Lincoln understood the heart of America. We are founded on God's law, eternal law, endowed by God. Lincoln urged the nation to pray, fast, and give thanks through nine proclamations during his four years in office. Imagine that, nine proclamations from the president calling for prayer and fasting. At Gettysburg, he reminded us that we are a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal. He asked us to persevere so that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. In his second inaugural address, he encouraged us to proceed with malice toward none and to bind up the nation's wounds. Lincoln lived from 1809 to 1865, and he once said, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. He referred to his education as by littles. A little here, and a little there. Perhaps one year of formal education altogether. Lincoln's kind, prayerful mother, Nancy Hanks, nurtured his love of learning. Tragically, she died at a young age, 34 years old. Lincoln was only nine years old. A year later, Lincoln's father remarried Sarah Bush Johnston, a widow and mother of three. Sarah recognized Abe's potential and encouraged him to read. Lincoln called Nancy his angel mother, and of Sarah he said, no son could love a mother more. Sarah wept inconsolably when learning of Lincoln's death. She passed away four years later at the age of 82. All women are mothers, some biological, some spiritual. All have what St. John Paul II called the feminine genius. Healthy nations honor mothers. In 1865, the year the Civil War ended, a poem entitled, What Rules the World, appeared. You may recognize the poem's most famous line. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Shaped by his angel mother and encouraged by his stepmother, Lincoln lived the American dream. This phrase, the American dream, first appeared in 1931 in the depths of the Depression. A century earlier, in 1832, Lincoln's friends urged him to run for office. He was only 23. And this is what he said. Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition, whether it be true or not, I can say for one that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed by my fellow men, by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. Three decades later, he traveled to the White House. Along the way, he stopped in Philadelphia and this is what he said. I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. For Lincoln, 
two words stood out, created equal. During the preceding decade, he emphasized these words in nearly all of his speeches. He had stepped away from politics, but the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 prompted him to return. This legislation permitted the expansion of slavery. Each new state would determine whether to permit slavery by a simple majority vote. Lincoln recognized this as a grave threat to the Union. Slavery predated the Declaration of Independence by more than 150 years. America inherited this pernicious practice. To placate the southern states, a compromise occurred at the Constitutional Convention. Article I authorized Congress to ban the slave trade in 20 years. And Congress did so at the earliest opportunity, January 1, 1808. Lincoln was born the following year. The parallel between Lincoln's time and ours is clear. Mark Twain once quipped, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> Historian Lewis Lehrman wisely put it this way, the great moral issue in America has always been the struggle to uphold the Declaration of Independence, and in our time, to restore the primacy of the inalienable right to life of the child in the womb. Inalienable rights are not subject to majority vote, and yet today, as in Lincoln's time, states are doing just that. A house divided cannot stand. Following the Civil War, America added the 14th Amendment to ensure that never again would we fail to uphold the inalienable rights of all. People are not property, no matter how small. How would Lincoln speak on behalf of life in our time? He would speak the truth with charity and clarity. He would strive to persuade through stories. This is what Pro-Life Partners Foundation aspires to do in collaboration with every person of good faith all across America. We have produced 11 brief ads, little stories, that we invite you to share. These ads follow best practices. They come through as a result of extensive consultation, and they're anchored in research. Together with the more than 3,000 pregnancy help centers and pro-life organizations, such as Life Legal, we offer these resources to be launched nationwide near Mother's Day. I'd like to share them with you now and suggest how Lincoln might introduce these. And perhaps if there's time at the end, you can provide some feedback. You're the first audience to see this collection. In Cleveland a few weeks ago, they saw part of it. You're seeing 10 of the 11. Lincoln would begin with equal protection. America began as an idea, a set of principles, a people united by certain truths. We are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. We are created equal. We bear the image of God, and so we merit equal protection from the moment we exist through all stages of life. That's who we are. That's fairness. That's justice. That's America. We haven't always lived up to these principles, but because of them, we have a path forward. A century and a half ago, we added the 14th Amendment to ensure that never again would we fail to provide equal protection for all. Through the leadership of Harry Beecher Stowe, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Booker T. Washington, John Bingham, Martin Luther King Jr., Mildred Jefferson, and many others, justice prevailed. But what about equal protection for those who can't speak for themselves? The littlest among us, the least among us, they too are entitled to equal protection. That's fairness, that's justice. Standing with mother and child, that's the 14th Amendment. That's equal protection for all.
these ads are designed to be discussion starters. So if you're boxed into a corner, you can direct someone to an ad and begin a conversation. We hope in particular that it will be helpful to those states that are facing these ballot proposals that Alexander was talking about earlier. Unfortunately, in Ohio, the other side got out of the gate a lot faster with their messaging. Lincoln would also proceed with compassion. Here's the truth. Abortion hurts. She didn't anticipate the situation, but now she must make a difficult choice. She can choose abortion, which might feel like a solution in the short term, but it leads to an aching sense of loss, depression, and a risk of infertility. Because abortion hurts women. But she also has another choice. She can choose to be a mother. Being a mother doesn't hurt. In fact, it can heal. And being a mother is more beautiful than anything you can imagine. Of course, it's not an easy road. But there are people who will walk with you, help you with childcare, healthcare, education, job training, even housing. You don't need abortion to succeed. You need support. And we will connect you with the support you need. Go to standingwithyou.org. We will support you. Tragically, some project that as high as 70% of abortions will now take place as a result of chemical abortion. So this one is designed to educate our country about, I'm sorry, th this particular video, I, I skipped to the next one. This one is um, in Ohio. There was um, an article that Planned Parenthood put out stating that late-term abortions are not real, that they, they don't happen. And uh, so this one is designed to set the record straight, as Lincoln would do. According to Planned Parenthood, there is no such thing as a late-term abortion. Really? Seven states and Washington, D.C. commit late-term abortions. The CDC tracks late-term abortions. More than 10,000 late-term abortions took place last year. And some centers specialize. Let's bypass the spin and call an abortion facility. I'm around 30 pregnant. Do y'all offer abortion at 30 weeks? Is the procedure safe and everything? Like, do y'all do these a lot? I'm just a little nervous about it. Is the baby like going to be really big at this point, or is it is it fully developed or anything yet? So yes, it would be in the third trimester. It doesn't have like a fully formed heart or head or anything yet, right? At thirty-two, it does. Okay, um, and y'all are still able to uh, do the abortion with the baby being that developed, right? Yes. Okay. The truth, later abortion is real. This is the one I started to introduce. It's entitled Little Pills That Kill. Abortion pills have been legal since 2000 and now make up for more than half of all abortions because they're being sold as the more comfortable solution. But abortion pills actually come with many complications and side effects, like severe pain, heavy and prolonged bleeding, fever, infection, and cramping. But these are just the complications that pro-abortion organizations mention. What they don't mention is that abortion pills can lead to blood clotting, described by one patient as the size of a lemon, incomplete abortions, 
which require follow-up surgical abortion, pain sometimes described as worse than childbirth, mental distress, and the fear of dying. And in some cases, the abortion pill has led to death of the mother. This isn't hyperbole. So far, 24 women have lost their lives from complications with abortion pills. And get this, nearly half of all women who take the abortion pill seek medical attention after. That doesn't sound very comfortable or safe, does it? In spite of these complications, abortion methods have fought to remove safety regulations and to disregard the research that says women have been hurt by abortion pills. But the truth is this, these little pills kill. I worked at Planned Parenthood as an RHA who we were told to mislead the women that came in looking for abortion pills. We were instructed to tell them the abortion pills were going to be easy, and we knew they weren't. Still, I was told to go to the grocery store and buy a lemon to show the woman how big the blocks would get. These women were experiencing intense pain, and they were afraid for their lives. Lincoln would also follow the research, and the research indicates that men who are involved in this epidemic that we're having, 85% approximately of abor abortions occur to women who are not married. The research indicates that men want to step up and be heroes, but they are struggling to do so. So this one is meant to speak to them. When I was little, I would pretend to be a hero. My toy box was full of chase, fire trucks, and army gear. But now life is complex. But what makes a hero remains constant. A hero defies the odds, stands strong, does what's right, even when it's not easy, particularly when it's not easy. But when faced with an unplanned pregnancy, men are told we don't have a voice. That doesn't feel right. Shouldn't we be there, helper, protector? One day our sons and daughters will ask, what did you do? And we want them to know that we stepped up. We supported their mother. We became fathers. And fathers can be heroes when they do what's right, even when it's not easy. This next ad speaks to women in a particular way and authentic, authentic feminine, feminism in the sense of authentic rights. Women have a history of rising above. When they blocked our right to vote, we marched. When they paid us less, we secured equal pay. When they devalued us, we built a movement. Now they tell us we need abortion to succeed that abortion is part of our empowerment. But there's no victory in ending the lives of our own children. There's no empowerment. There's only harm and loss. Abortion hurts. It leaves us with a giant hole in who we are. When someone tells us we are not up to the challenge of being a mother, let's remind them who we are, what we have overcome, how we have risen above. We don't need abortion to succeed. Lincoln would have encouraged good fathers. He didn't have a good father, but he found a way to be a very good father himself. So often, we are flooded with images of the angry father, or the foolish father, or the disconnected father. We are called to be more. A father is safe. A father is confident and consistent. A father is a huge hug that lets you know everything will be okay. A father is sure-footed in a difficult world. And for some of us, 
This isn't our experience, but we can break free from the sins of our fathers. John Mize, the CEO of Americans United for Life, did just that. My mom um, was pregnant with me. I was the youngest of three boys. Um, and my biological father cheated on my mom and left her uh, uneducated, unemployed, and she very much so leaned into her faith, leaned into her desire to have me. Um, and you know, I, I think because of that, my entire life, I've sought to help those that are the most vulnerable. I have had a chip on my shoulder my entire life that I would not repeat uh, the mistakes that my biological father made. Um, and um, I also had uh, the privilege uh, of uh, not formally being adopted. My mom remarried when I was 10, uh, and Herm was a uh, high school history teacher, a golf coach, and a basketball coach. Um, he died when I was 14, um, which was a travesty. Uh, however, um, you know, his legacy lives on in me. I've taken his last name officially when I became 15, um, and, and I would love to honor him for, uh, you know, while it was only four years, it was in four very pivotal years uh, in my development. And so there's two components to that, the chip on my shoulder that I'll never repeat how my biological father acted and then honoring the man who um, I, take, I took his name uh, and you know, have identified uh, him as my father my entire life. Lincoln would have tremendous compassion for women who have experienced the horror of the crime of rape. That's a topic which is unthinkable and unfortunately the other side exploits that. This is a true story and this is one way of starting the conversation. Theo was born 11 years ago and like all children his story intertwines with his mother's. Liam's mother, Rebecca, was raped and became pregnant at 18. The man who assaulted her was more than twice her age, and she was homeless. She couldn't provide for a child, and she was a victim of a violent crime. But circumstances, even horrible circumstances, do not define us. Rebecca leaned into hope. She persisted with courage, and she gave birth to Liam. A family adopted Liam, and the adopted father says, Rebecca and Liam have taught us way more than we could ever teach them. The message, compassion. This story is complicated. It's personal, it's gut-wrenching. It's also inspiring, a story of hope. Rebecca and Liam's lives are intertwined. We cannot diminish Rebecca's trauma but we also cannot dehumanize Liam. Both need our help. Both deserve our help. We must be compassionate to both. Support both. Embrace both. Welcome both. Love both. There are people who have survived abortions. This too is a true story. In August 1977, a 19-year-old college student, Ruth, wasn't feeling herself. Ruth's mother, an OBGYN nurse, recognized the symptoms. Ruth was pregnant. Ruth was engaged to Elliot, her high school boyfriend, but their engagement couldn't save their baby. Ruth's mother was livid. They pleaded with her, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter that they wanted the baby. And it didn't matter that they would soon be married. Ruth's mother demanded an abortion. This was the last time Ruth ever saw Elliot. Ruth was taken to the hospital where her mother worked and where a doctor owed her a favor. Without proper consideration and without Ruth's consent, 
The doctor performed the saving abortion. Ruth and her preborn baby suffered. The saving solution burned the baby's body. After five days, Ruth was finally induced. Everyone expected a dead baby, but I was born instead. My name is Melissa Oden, and I am the founder and CEO of the Abortion Survivors Network. Most people do not realize that abortions fail, are stopped, or reversed, and survivors like me exist. There are an estimated 85,817 abortion survivors since 1973, which means there are roughly 1,734 survivors every year. The trauma of abortion survival is real. You feel isolated, disregarded, and different in a way that no one else can understand. We are the abortion pills. I am not a clump of cells. I am a human being. All of us are human beings. All of us have equal value. Abortion is not health care. Abortion is not reproductive choice. Abortion is the intentional killing of a human being. We are survivors. We pull back the curtain. We personify the violence. We are literally the voice of the voiceless. And for survivors, we're here for you. We exist for you. We will help you. We are the Abortion Survivors Network. Abraham Lincoln was instrumental in the passage of the 13th Amendment. Steven Spielberg has a wonderful movie entitled Lincoln that tells that story. Unfortunately, he was assassinated before the 14th Amendment was possible, but this was the natural next step, and he certainly would have advocated for the 14th Amendment. Lincoln had been retired from politics for five years. What caused him to return? Legislation passed by Congress permitting the expansion of slavery in the new states by simple majority vote. Lincoln saw through the smokescreen. This ignored inalienable rights. This eviscerated the Declaration of Independence. Beginning with his speech at Peoria in 1854, he would spend the next 11 years bringing attention to created people. If votes being denied liberty are property, as ruled by the Supreme Court in Dred Scott, then no cause for concern. But if human beings, then they are denied their inherent, inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It would require the best of Lincoln's gifts of persuasion, reason, and articulation to bring his fellow citizens to see the truth of the matter. In the end, the war came, and Reconstruction followed, necessitating the 14th Amendment. The amendment's author, John Bingham, penned sweeping language. He sought a simple, strong, plain declaration guaranteeing equal protection, no matter how weak, how simple, no matter how friendless. From the moment we exist, we are endowed by our Creator. We are created equal. We have naming rights. And we are guaranteed equal protection, no matter how weak, how simple, no matter how small. That's the 14th Amendment. Lewis Lehrman noted, it must be explained to the American people that the same Congresses that prohibited slavery explicitly incorporated into federal law criminal codes restricting abortion. While visiting America 200 years after the Constitutional Convention, Pope John Paul II said, the dignity of America, the reason she exists, the condition of her survival, yes, the ultimate test of her greatness, to respect every human person, especially the weak and most defenseless ones, those as yet unborn. Two years from now, America will celebrate the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. As Lincoln noted, the way is plain, peaceful, generous, just, 
a way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. Every life counts. Everyone deserves a chance. That's the American dream. The blessings of liberty to us and our posterity. The preborn are our posterity. Abraham Lincoln would have been an awesome pro-life lawyer. He knew sorrow, but he also knew hope. And he lived by faith, hope, and love. And so did his grandmother. You see, Lincoln almost never existed. His grandmother experienced an unexpected pregnancy. She was an unwed mother. She was frightened. But she courageously proceeded, and God abundantly blessed her. She gave birth to a beautiful baby girl and named her Nancy. Nancy grew to be a strong, virtuous, caring mother. She gave birth to a beautiful baby boy and named him Abe, Abraham Lincoln. Abortion impacts generations, nations. It's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. May Lincoln's honesty, integrity, compassion, and courage inspire us all to protect all. Thank you for supporting Life Legal. Thank you for supporting life. May God bless you, and may God bless America. So I don't know if Lincoln would have been as awesome as Alexandra with regard to what she's doing all over the country, but that's why we're here tonight. And I, I know that um, you're here to support Life Legal, and, and I'd like to make some comments about that. But before I do that, uh, if there are any questions, if there's time, I'm happy to respond. I thank you for your patience in watching, you know, sort of rapid fire these messages that will be launched around the country. Um, there's one more video that didn't make it, uh, and that's on motherhood. It's a, a beautiful uh, video on motherhood. But the purpose of these ads um, is to equip the entire nation to restart the conversation. I had the privilege of knowing Dr. Bernard Nathanson. He served as an expert witness on a case that I had before his conversion, and he was the darkest soul I have ever met in my life the most tormented person I've ever met. And about seven years later, at this point I was in Catholic higher education, and I noticed that he was coming to speak to Michigan because he had published a new book called The Hand of God. And so my lovely wife, Mary Claire, we have a large family as you've heard, I said, could we go to this dinner? I really would love, I haven't seen him since that dark day in New York City when he was the witness in her case. And uh, we did, and I have never seen a more magnificent transformation. He could not have been more humble, uh, more compliant, and more dedicated to undoing the deception that he had unleashed. Uh, Life Legal is battling that deception every day. Uh, it's getting worse. It's becoming institutionalized. And uh, it's a cancer that has to be eradicated. Um, I thank Russ for allowing me to present Lincoln to you because slavery was, of course, a horrible cancer, was, of course, completely anathema to who we are as America. But because the principles that are laid out in our system are in place, we have the opportunity to educate, to persuade, and ultimately to, to win, uh, because that's the truth. But we're in a, a horrible spiritual battle as well. Uh, deception comes from the father of all lies. It's a profound, uh, diabolical uh, situation. And in this past year, you've seen that Satan is uh, more and more visible. Unfortunately, a neighboring state 
permitted a, sort of an image of a satanic force in the Capitol at Christmas time. Um, lots of other sort of out in the open. There are those who though say that in a sense that could be a good sign that the evil side realizes their time is coming to an end. So I urge you to consider uh, utilizing and sharing these ads. Uh, this has been a project that's been ongoing for about nine months. And there'll be two webinars, one on Tuesday, April 30th. Um, we'll get it out to Russ and others. That's primarily for leaders across the country to learn about how to download and use these ads um, and to encourage their organizations. And then uh, the following Tuesday, May 7th, we'll be introducing them to anyone across the country. We held a webinar after the Dobbs decision and within two days of promoting it, we had over 23,000 people. So you know, we're hoping something on an even larger scale occurs with this. This is all free product that is meant to just flood the airwaves. So, um, so you were very patient in seeing a lot of these rapid fire, but if you envision these being sent uh, strategically, um, you know, hopefully they will catch on and hopefully they will be um, so the kind of messaging that will become commonplace uh, and get us in a position where we can uh, comfortably advance ultimately the 14th Amendment. So are there any questions or is there anything else that we should do? Yes, ma'am. Will this be on regular TV? Could we get these on TV? Yeah, so the question is, can we get this on TV? And so um, my hope is that we can demonstrate the impact uh, by the free social media and uh, that there will be um, people who have the capacity to purchase ads and uh, we can test market which ones are really resonating and then um, that would be the time where we would ask, say, we, we can show that there's a return on this investment. So do you have a favorite ad that you would like to recommend? <laughs> there was one going through but they're all great. Oh good. They're all great but there was one I would like. This is my great aunt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, um, do, do you want to have the microphone so people well, can hear you? I, yeah. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I can hear. Lincoln was a uh, politician. And he had the guts enough to say what he said and stand for the life of the slaves. And he was elected to Congress and Do you think we have any politicians that would be willing to take on any of those 11 that you have and put it with their political ads? I think we need politicians to get involved in what you're doing here and spreading that message. I'm not sure we have politicians that will do it. Your yeah. thoughts? Uh, that's a great question. And um, we've, we've gone through a half a century where the law, which is a very draconian teacher, it can be for good or bad, has falsely taught that you have a constitutional right to end your pregnancy. And, uh, so the culture is in a, a, a difficult place where we have to be the program. Uh, and so I'm not a politician. I don't know um, the dynamics of those who are running. I, I very much am drawn to Lincoln's first political statement, which was uh, his motivation for being in politics was so noble. And um, I, I think that uh, there are um, people who are now in a position, maybe perhaps uh, with sufficient security with their life, uh, that would be comfortable running completely on principle without any concern about whether you're ultimately elected. Um, right now, the uh, statement that President Reagan, I'm sorry, President Trump issued uh, created a lot of concern for pro life leaders around the country. Uh, should he have said, that he's in favor of a ban. Uh, I, I am of the belief that he did the right thing at this time. Um, you have to, Lincoln was very savvy about, if you watch the movie about the 13th Amendment, uh, he, he was very savvy about positioning. And he spent, as I said, 11 years talking about created equal to get, uh, get that message out there. So I think at this particular moment, um, those running for public office should be advancing those principles and then should say, or could say, comfortably say, uh, that 
the Supreme Court uh, in Dobbs sent the question back to the states so that the country can discuss it. Uh, but the politicians should also have to be courageous enough to say, but there is an answer here. The 14th Amendment, the legislative history behind the 14th Amendment, Alexandra's article is a wonderful, concise description of how to talk about the 14th Amendment. Um, and, and that that's the ultimate answer. And that that may, uh, that someday, hopefully soon, the Supreme Court will be confronted with that specific question, which was discussed in the oral argument in 1972. You can now go to the library and take out the audio tape and you can hear when one of the justices asks Sarah Weddington, the attorney for the abortion side, the youngest person ever to argue before the US Supreme Court. And she literally has sort of a adolescent giggle in response and says, well, that would be a very difficult. Uh, if you apply the 14th Amendment, I have no case. She, she admits it, it's on the audio. So I'd like to do a commercial with that audio tape. <laughs> um, so we have to get to that place and we have to also build our culture where we, um, unfortunately, 85% of abortions are occurring because we're not living the virtue of chastity. You know, we've uh, Planned Parenthood as part of their business plan introduced curriculum into all the schools 40 years ago through SICUS that um, misled uh, our youth and corrupted our culture. Um, so, but, you know, it, <laughs> hope springs eternal. We have to make a, um, uh, we have to make a course correction. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm hoping that these uh, ads will help provide language for those running for public office. Just a quick question kind of going off that, but kind of circulating around current events that are happening. So there's a big court case in Arizona, as you probably know recently, uh, that overruled an abortion. And I just want to get your thoughts on if that was the, a good move for the court to make, or was it too aggressive of a move in that there might be a lot of pushback this November? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm our, our system of government is, um, an amazing, uh, I would say, providentially given balance between three branches. Uh, it was a miracle that there were sufficiently virtuous and highly educated people at the time of the writing of the Constitution. Uh, so the court did absolutely the right thing. The court's job is not to kind of determine whether or not this is going to have a good effect for the culture or whatever. It's uh, the law that was in place um, by Arizona as it was with many states right around the Civil War because in, uh, with, to protect the human being from the moment they knew the human being existed. Uh, so in 1859, before the Civil War started, we have in medicine in the United States the first time under microscope where the medical community was able to have empirical observable evidence that life begins at that amazing moment. There's even a flash of light uh, at conception. So that's why all the state laws changed at that time, including Arizona's around that time. So uh, the court acted with integrity by um, acknowledging that. And there, there will be, you know, and you can see the consequences of the various people trying to scurry around that, but um, we have to be standing on principle. So, uh, any other questions? Or Russ, are you? Okay. I was wondering if, um, if there have been any court cases that have used, for example, there's 2.2 million people that are looking to adopt. And um, also, I read an article probably about 25 years ago where a professor talked about um, the unborn are future taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just kind of wondering if maybe, I don't know if there, if there could be an ad regarding those facts. So if people who aren't truly pro-life but could actually see, oh yeah, this is impacting our, you know, our deficit you know, by not having these people here. Yeah. No, that, 
that's a brilliant, brilliant suggestion and insight. The um, last time I was able to present some of these videos, uh, another person suggested we need a, an ad on adoption. And uh, uh, so I mentioned at the outset, that these ads resulted from gathering the research that terrific organizations around the country had collected and, and 11 issues kind of came to the top. But that's number 12. I mean, that, <laughs> that is really a great, a great point. And we are in a demographic winter, it's called, uh, where we, our birth rate now is, is not sufficient to um, replace and build up a healthy culture. Uh, so it, it's because we've um, devalued the beauty of motherhood and we've these other aspects of um, the wrong education about what it means to be a human person and families. Um, so I, that's, a, that's a beautiful insight and, and um, I'm hoping these will be successful and that um, we can justify doing more. So it's a great point. Yes. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, my husband is a pro-life or was a pro-life candidate. You wouldn't believe how rude some of these people are at the door. So when you stand up and you say nobody is, my husband was. He went to the door, they called him a fucker, they said, oh no, they slammed the door in his face. So don't assume that they are. I could give you one name of a politician who I'm very confident is uh, pro-life, and that would be Senator Julia Coleman. Yeah, so you do know one. Okay, another comment. Um, I don't think people realize politically what you're up against. Um, my husband's been a local politician for about the last 20 some years. So we've been married, I've been part of that, okay. So once upon a time, I ran for county commissioner. It's like 20, 25 years ago. And I had this woman call me up one day and she goes, are you pro-life or pro-choice? I said, because I know a little about politics from where I live. I said, that's not a county level issue. And she said, no, where do you stand on it? And I said, it's not a county level issue. It really doesn't matter. She goes, you might want to go to higher election after this. That's what they said. These people work very hard in the background. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at some of your pro-life candidates, um, my husband's a Republican. These are not financially supported as well as some of these Democrats. If you don't believe me, go to the um, campaign finance board. You can look up any candidate you want and you will see the Democrats, they really get a lot of funding. A lot of funding comes from other places. So. Don't be too hard on your politicians. It's not easy to be pro-life out there, but I know a lot of you know that, so I don't want to preach to the choir. I just want to share that there are pro-life candidates. Um, those are excellent points, and it brings up another very, very grim reality, which is that um, the abortion side has a sort of money laundering scheme going on where it used to be about 10 years ago, a half a billion dollars in tax, tax dollars were going to Planned Parenthood and then Planned Parenthood recycles that back to politicians who will ensure that continues. It's now up, and with the last three years, the current group in the White House have increased that to about 750,000 uh, a year. So, so uh, seven million, thank you. Seven hundred fifty million. So, you know, approaching a billion dollars every year going to an entity that uh, is already making a billion. So, so in human and practical terms, it's a hopeless situation. But, um, in, you know, we're not dealing in those terms. We're the, the other side. The responses you got at the door are are coming from a very dark place, uh, and uh, we have these truth principles that have to be articulated. And another thing that has changed is with Dobbs, uh, we have the recognition, the language is very strong, that the Roe and its progeny were egregiously wrong cases. Of course they were. So we're now in a position where we can at least uh, have the discussion, and uh, that's why I was suggesting it may take politicians who are in a place financially where they're, they're not needing the office necessarily to sustain their monthly income. Uh, and we are in a position where we can talk principles in a way that we couldn't when it was uh, when Roe was in place. So, but yeah, we'll take miracles for this to unwind. 
Uh, if you think how embedded the slave economy was for our country, uh, that, that too was a monstrous obstacle overcome. It was a, a huge percentage of our GNP. But miracles happen. Uh, yes? Just quickly. My name is Sue Ack. I'm running as a Republican candidate for the House in St. Cloud. And Minnesota has a strange program called the Political Contribution Refund Program. You can all give $75 to a political candidate and get it back from the state. Do, do, it's a do totally to make silly, a but I encourage us to, 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 to all take advantage of it. Do you want to tell <laughs> And oh, I sure, am a yeah, pro-life yeah, candidate, okay. I promise. So I appreciate, appreciate your talk very much. Thank you very much. I will be available to respond to any kind of questions. I just wanted to make a couple of comments about the, the importance of supporting life legal. You're, you're here tonight, you're already supporting, but there's, um, there's an envelope at the table that provides additional ways to support. And uh, I can't think of a more important return on investment than what life legal does. Why? So, the other side is very much emboldened. Um, I, I've met the Hauk family, the father of seven that had the SWAT team that came to his home. Uh, we're dealing with something very evil here. We need talented lawyers. Alexandra is an example of that. Not only are they strong in their team, but then they're training lawyers all over the country to represent these heroic people who grow up the sidewalk, who try to express that they have opportunities to help women, that this is not the only choice they have to make. Uh, so we're looking at uh, 100 years from now, Life Legal will be in the history books as one of the good guys on the, on the side that turned the tide. And you in your own way will be too, because you're supporting them. They can't do the work without it. So, so please consider, a, considering maybe a monthly uh, donation, kind of similar to how any other bill you might pay and, and, and feel good about it, <laughs> uh, or, or whatever amount you can support, because uh, Life Legal is just one of those gold standards that uh, they're doing everything right, and with their support, that's the best case for literally saving our country. This is that, that serious. So thank you for being here. I'd be happy to stay and answer questions. I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, Michael. I actually have a quick question for you regarding the videos, which I thought yeah. were fabulous. I mean, just so powerful. I was almost crying at a couple of them. Um, but are these only available to organizations, or are these mm -hmm. available to everybody? Everybody, yeah. So please be aware that you will also all be able to access these videos. And I say that because we work very hard in the courtroom. We work very hard in the public square to try to convince people, um, and, and we do billboard campaigns, we do all kinds of things. In fact, we did recently a, a chastity billboard campaign um, because we don't see those very much anymore in response to something that California Governor Gavin Newsom did, which was horrendous. Um, but we put out a, a bill and it just said, safe sex for marriage, plan your, um, plan your future, not your abortion. So, and then we have a website called Abortionless Future that goes with that. So, and, and those things are great and really important, but what we saw in Ohio with the defeat of, um, with, the, with the passage of issue one, the, the abortion amendment there, by a margin of 60 to 40%, 60% of the people who vote, voted for it to make, create a constitutional right to abortion, those same people had the year before elected a radically pro-life governor I mean, it's just really schizophrenic, but what we're seeing is that everybody needs to start talking about this to their families, to their friends, to their neighbors, and these videos that Michael showed today are a great tool to do that. So if you just keep that in mind, when you think of somebody who maybe you've had a hard time talking to them about pro-life issues, you can send them the video and just say, hey, just take a look at this, and then and again, as he said, their whole purpose is to foster conversation and then say, hey, if you want to talk about this, I'm ready to talk. If not, that's okay. I mean, I, I don't think you can force somebody into this position. But at least, because these are really, really good. And, and 
think you probably know who, which people you know who might be maybe moved by one or more of these, these videos. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. We just so appreciate you being here. Um, as Michael said, there are envelopes on the table, so please feel free to fill those out. You can use checks, credit cards, any form of currency, although I don't think we take Bitcoin yet. <laughs> um, and, then, um, and then we'll come and collect those as, as the evening goes on. But feel free to stay if you have questions for Michael, if you have questions for me or my team. I do want to recognize Mary Riley and Wendy Cravalo, who are sitting over here. Um, if you guys could just stand up. I just thank you. We have an amazing, a, a small team, but an amazing team. So thank you, Mary and Wendy. Uh, thank you, Russ, so much for just organizing this, for getting people together. You're such a connector, and we're so grateful for you. So, no, we're Russ Lumber. Thank you, Russ. And again, thank you, all of you. And, um, and let's give one more hand to our Senior Defenders of Life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because we would not be doing what we do if it were not for you. So thank you. God bless you all. Have a great evening, and I hope to see you again next year or before. God bless you.